Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone and welcome to this satellite event of the World Forum for Democracy on Young Environmental Defenders and Their Rights. My name is Jade Glenister and I am moderating today's event on behalf of the Expert Council on NGO Law. Um, I'll very briefly introduce our speakers today um, and then say a few words about uh, why we thought it was so important to host this event today. Um, so joining us for our keynote, keynote speech is the Council of Europe Commissioner for Human Rights, Dunja Miotovic. We are also joined on our panel by Katerina Hadzi Mietza Evans, who is a member of the Expert Council on NGO Law, Bruce Adamson, Children and Young People's Commissioner of Scotland, Tina Ros Steinstottir, who is an international expert on child participation and safeguarding, Ilyas El Kortby, Fridays for Future climate justice activist in Ukraine, and Linus Dolda, Fridays for Future Germany. Um, so as you've just heard, we have a really great range of expertise in our virtual room today. So I'll keep my initial comments about why we thought it was important to hold this event very brief so we can get on to our speakers. Um, so this is the ninth World Forum for Democracy organized by the Council of Europe. And the theme uh, for this year is, can democracy save the environment? So obviously, as we all know, it's been a really challenging year, and that's meant that the way that the forum has run has changed this year. And that has meant that we are able to hold virtual events like these. So each month of the 12 months, uh, the forum has focused on a particular topic. So the topic for May is defending the defenders, and the topic for June is children and youth leading the fight against climate change. So given those two topics, we thought it was a particularly good time to hold an event on young environmental defenders and their rights. Um, it's a topic that's of particular expert, it, beg your pardon, it's a topic that's of particular interest to the Expert Council on NGO Law, um, as we aim, along with the Council of Europe's Conference of INGOs, to assist in the creation of an enabling environment for NGOs and wider civil society. We know that climate change is an urgent and significant problem. It's almost hard to, to convey in words just how urgent uh, and significant of a problem it is. And we also know that it disproportionately impacts on children and young people. So hopefully our panel today will be able to give some ideas about how we can better hear the voice of children and young people on this issue, as given it's so crucially important to them and their futures. Um, with that in mind, we will be holding a question and answer session after we hear from all our speakers. I hope we'll have around 45 minutes uh, for a panel discussion. So please use the chat function to ask questions as we go, and then I will put them to our speakers at the end. Um, so without further ado, I would like to hand over to the commissioner who is delivering our keynote speech. We are delighted to have her here, um, given the work that she's been doing on the independent nature, interdependent nature, sorry, of human rights and the environment. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jade. It is a great pleasure to be with you, um, uh, fellow panelists, but also uh, all that are listening and watching us um, in cyberspace. It is a great honor uh, to be part of this extremely important uh, uh, discussion. And as you rightly <clears throat> stated, Jade, uh, this is part uh, of my portfolio and my recent work. Uh, and that is even more uh, you know, important and valuable to continue uh, listening to many of you uh, in order to be able to address um, issues that are affecting our societies now, but particularly uh, future generations and everything that uh, will happen in the future. Um, I'm really grateful for your invitation uh, and uh, uh, I'm also uh, delighted to be part of it because the theme um, on which uh, my office or my team um, that many of you already met and know are working really hard uh, in order to be able to uh, address uh, certain issues that we see are part uh, of, of the mandate that I have as Commissioner for, uh, for Human Rights. Uh, I would start, uh, first of all, by saying something that uh, seems um, obvious uh, to you, uh, but I think it is worth uh, repeating over and over again. 
that environment and uh, human rights are interdependent, intertwined and interconnected. Uh, there is a clear uh, link between them. And living uh, in an environment that is uh, unhealthy, uh, degraded, um, including uh, by human uh, interventions uh, and climate change often results uh, in um, grave violations of, of uh, human rights. Uh, environmental harm uh, may interfere uh, with basic uh, human rights and, and freedoms, such as the right to life, uh, to private and family life, uh, to peaceful enjoyment uh, of the home, uh, or freedom uh, from inhuman or uh, degrading treatment. Uh, but it also impacts uh, negatively on many social, cultural, uh, economic rights, such as the right to health, uh, food, uh, water uh, and sanitation, adequate housing, uh, or even education. Uh, and conversely, respect for human rights is absolutely vital uh, for the effective protection uh, of the environment. It would be futile to protect uh, the environment uh, without being able to rely on human rights, freedoms, uh, such as freedom of expression, uh, association or assembly, uh, the right to effective uh, remedy uh, or the right to education. Uh, these so-called uh, enabling um, uh, or procedural uh, rights are the primary tools uh, that empower people to take effective uh, action against uh, environmental degradation uh, and climate change. I felt uh, it necessary to uh, restate the link uh, between environment and human rights to make the following point. Uh, that the people who act uh, to prevent environmental degradation, including climate change, uh, contribute to the protection of our human rights. And I think this is absolutely crucial. These individuals, groups, um, networks, or organizations, environmental human rights defenders, uh, often put themselves on the line and expose themselves to considerable danger and risk. And we cannot claim uh, any longer uh, to be serious about protecting um, the environment uh, or combating uh, climate change um, unless we protect those defenders too. Uh, many environmental defenders are ordinary people uh, who are forced to act by circumstances uh, or necessity. And I would like to, uh, to stress, sorry, uh, uh, the necessity uh, part here. Why? I believe that youth movements that defend the climate and fight environmental uh, degradation around the world today are acting precisely out of necessity. Children, young people are affected by environmental harm and climate change more than others. Already now, uh, it is they who bear the brunt of the damage, and they will likely be bearing it also in the future. And this needs to be recognized, um, that there are actually the driving force behind this, and that all of us working in this environment, trying to protect the environment, should recognize this before we move forward. We need to listen to those voices. We need to recognize uh, what, what is important. Uh, and this is also something that I'm trying to emphasize more and more uh, in my talks with the different government officials um, using every single opportunity in order to pass this message. Children and future generations will likely be overburdened, not just by the consequences of environmental harm, uh, of today, but also by the hard measures uh, that states will have to take uh, to curb uh, emissions 10, 20 or 30 uh, years from now. So we need to start moving fast. Uh, it would be very wrong uh, in this discussion to see children simply as uh, victims only. 
there are also powerful uh, actors of change. And I find it extremely, extremely encouraging that so many young people uh, in Europe and elsewhere, globally, uh, come together around different initiatives to demand rights related to a clean and healthy environment by exercising their human right. Um, and the huge mobilization uh, of young people, all somehow extremely visibly um, and differently united uh, in defense of the climate and the environment is to me the most hope um, inspiring, uh, encouraging uh, development uh, in the world today. Uh, in a very difficult time uh, when there are so many challenges, not to go into details uh, about those challenges now. So this is um, also something for all of us uh, working to protect rights. Uh, this momentum needs to be recognized in order to be able to move forward. Uh, to witness 4 million people worldwide go on climate uh, strike uh, like they did in 2019 is, you know, it is really unprecedented. Um, young people make their voices um, heard and they effectively put pressure on governments in taking global action. Their examples inspire, inspires others. Uh, at least, you know, this is an inspiration for me and my team. Uh, and this is also unprecedented. You do not have situations like this uh, all the time. If we look at the history, of course, there are moments, but this is also one of those moments we need to really pull uh, all our forces and join our voices in defending something that is so important for the future generations and for the future of our uh, planet. Uh, public protests and campaigns um, that there are governments, um, you know, the, going hand in hand with other types of, of, of action. And just this month, I can say that um, uh, and share with you uh, something that you already may be aware of, that I filed my observations in support uh, of a case brought uh, to the European Court of Human Rights by six young people from Portugal, uh, who argue uh, that global warming uh, negatively impacted their living conditions and health. Many young uh, environmental activists claim their rights of access to justice uh, by taking up and also at the same time winning uh, environmental cases before the court. This is also unprecedented. And I regret, however, um, that the governments in Europe, um, governments, uh, states that are member states of the Council of Europe and beyond, uh, that see and somehow misinterpret um, environmental defenders as uh, suspicious um, or as a threat uh, and respond with reprisal or otherwise limit their scope uh, of action. Uh, this is unacceptable. In December, I convened an online roundtable uh, with an environmental human rights defenders from across Europe. Uh, many uh, of them young people, uh, lawyers and campaigners. Uh, a report from this roundtable is uh, publicly um, available and the event provided me and uh, my team uh, with many real life uh, examples on how environment, uh, environmental defenders are currently facing attacks uh, on all fronts um, in Europe. This is also extremely important to document, uh, to have data and statistics at a very, very early stage in order to be able to address these issues with the governments and to tackle it uh, during global um, events. Um, one such front uh, is the increased use of uh, restrictive legislation that affects the legitimate exercise uh, of the freedom of assembly. Um, and peaceful protests, uh, discouraging uh, people's participation in environmental demonstrations. These are either um, sweeping um, laws uh, that place undue restrictions um, on all kinds of public protests or so-called foreign agent uh, type uh, laws, 
uh, that brand certain organizations as undesirable um, or ad hoc uh, legislation adopted to restrict public scrutiny during specific events uh, like the United Nations Climate uh, Change Conferences. Uh, and the way the existing laws are applied is also often quite uh, problematic. Um, simple participation uh, in uh, environmental protests is often equated with unlawful activity uh, or used as a ground for imposing restrictions on freedom of movement uh, or the right to liberty. Public participation in global environmental summits like the COP conferences is curtailed and environmental protesters uh, placed under surveillance or preventive um, house arrest. Uh, general rules on public assemblies are sometimes uh, applied selectively uh, to the detriment of environmental groups. Environmental organizations uh, and movements are smeared. Uh, activists are cyber bullied. Uh, in the social media. Many are uh, targeted by um, different uh, lawsuits, so-called slaps, uh, which also frequently use against environmental journalists. And this is uh, an issue I raised uh, on several occasions, also in my human rights comment that is publicly available. And last but not uh, least, many young uh, environmental human rights uh, defenders are simply played down Irrated, ignored, or told to chill. This is also unacceptable. You should never give in or give up in presenting what is your right. Uh, and this right is uh, something that, uh, as Commissioner for Human Rights, um, I'm going to monitor, follow, and at the same time defend. We must um, reverse this harmful trend. And let me conclude. Um, with a few words now on the obligation of states uh, to provide safe uh, space for environmental human rights defenders and to guarantee and protect the enabling uh, rights. There are several standards um, that can be relied upon, including by the Council of Europe, the OSC and the UN, uh, on the protection of human rights defenders more generally and on the protection of promotion of civil society. Many of them are listed in the short brief developed by the Expert Council on NGOs law uh, that is being launched by today's uh, event. And I very much welcome this very helpful and timely publication. Next Tuesday, I will, pub I will be publishing my um, own human rights comment uh, on environmental human rights defenders, uh, which will include several recommendations in this area. And I would like to focus today on these five uh, key messages very briefly. First, uh, we need governments to adopt zero tolerance policy on human rights uh, violations against environmental human rights defenders and environmental journalists. You should not forget about journalists. Council of Europe member states must provide a safe and enabling environment for environmental human rights defenders to operate free from violence, intimidation, harassment, or threats. Any threat or violence, including by non-state actors, must be swiftly and firmly condemned. And whenever violations occur, victims must be able to access effective remedies and count on full and effective investigations. So nothing new, but at the same time extremely important uh, all these issues are already put on paper, but we need to move away from the paper. Um, and wonderful words on paper, we need action. Second, the ongoing stigmatization on, um, on, uh, of sorry, environmental human rights defenders must stop. Uh, this includes stigmatizing remarks coming from public officials, uh, as well as non-state actors, both offline and online. Uh, and by this, I also mean something that probably many of you uh, will recognize. Uh, I'm here talking uh, about patronizing uh, or dismissive remarks made by some politicians and opinion leaders about young environmental defenders. Enough of calling uh, environmental defenders names like uh, extremists, 
uh, terrorists uh, or otherwise misinterpreting their work, they should be supported and given recognition. Third, states and non-state actors should respect and protect freedom of expression, association and peaceful assembly on environmental matters. Public protests and campaigners are often the most effective environmental advocacy tools for raising uh, public awareness and affecting change. Young people often have no other way uh, by civil, uh, but civil, sorry, disobedience to make things better and to make them visible. Fourth, young environmental defenders must be able to genuinely participate in decision making on all policies and projects with an environmental impact and to access the relevant public information. And five, uh, states should strive to ensure public awareness on environmental matters and uh, to educate uh, people from the earliest age about the need to preserve the environment and how to do so. On many occasions uh, previously we failed, uh, but I think it's important to talk about also environmental literacy. We need more young uh, and engaged environmental human rights uh, defenders in European governments, um, if they are serious uh, about fighting environmental pollution and uh, climate change, uh, they should begin by protecting and empowering young, in, young environmental um, defenders. And of course, by making Europe a safe place for their engagement. At least I think they deserve this uh, in 21st century. I wish you uh, a fruitful discussion uh, and uh, I can assure you that I will continue uh, working with you, uh, defending your rights uh, and trying to have a real impact as Commissioner for Human Rights on this issue that I personally but also professionally see as a huge challenge uh, and at the same time extremely important. I wish you a very fruitful discussion. Uh, I will stay for a while, uh, then I will have to leave, uh, but my team will also continue following and I do hope to meet many of you soon also in person. Thank you very much. Many thanks for those comments, uh, Dunia. I, I personally feel we're all extremely lucky to have you in our, in our corners as Commissioner. Um, some very strong and inspiring words there and I think uh, I, I really relate to your point about um, how inspiring it is to, to see children as actors of change and how inspiring the climate strikes have been. I think reflecting on getting ready for this, for this event, it's just extraordinary to see what, what children have been able to do with the school strikes. Um, and also your, uh, your words on the necessity of states to protect uh, the rights of peaceful protest really ring true. Um, that's why the expert council was so eager to do the brief. Um, so I'll hand over to Katerina now to speak about that brief. Thank you very much, Jade. So, and thank you, Commissioner, for your really impressive and really encouraging statement. And indeed, looking back at the years, I would like to mark September 2019, when more than four to six million people, young people for over 150 countries from around the world went on a climate strike. It is considered as the largest demonstration in history, especially on climate issues. And that demonstration shows us an amazing power of the youth to gather across the world, to voice their concerns, put forward their asks and their demand to be part of the solutions. And they not only have a legitimate interest, but as you said, also human rights to do so. The youth are increasing, mobilizing to defend their rights, and they have importantly triggered jointly big social movements and sometimes change legal actions, as you said as well. And despite the differences in how they organize, they do enjoy those protections from legal perspective and from international perspective. So just a short summary of what those are. So the first of all is their right to freedom of association, to form groups formally and informally, to come together in coalitions, in networks or in movements. And no matter what form they take, they have to be protected and they have to be able to join together without being discriminated just because of their age. Then they have the right to participation. 
ability to be part of the policy making process, heard in it, and to be able to provide their opinion. And as the commissioner said, they have the right to freedom of assembly, meaning that they have to be able to get on the street, to join their groups, to speak about positive development they see, but also to express criticism around policies or decisions made by governments or companies. And with the development of the technology, they also have the right to be present online, not just offline. They have to be heard on social media, internet, and they can use different technological tools to come together, as we see across the world within their societies. And the rights to be, uh, the human rights to enjoy their association, assembly participation, offline are equally protected online, and states have to ensure this happens. Now, the Commissioner really nicely explained how the human rights defenders and environmental defenders and young defenders are under attack. And we really wanted with this event to actually raise that awareness and to be able to also, what uh, she said, document, to start working on that awareness and document what kind of attacks are happening. But in the same time, with the Expert Council, we wanted to also provide initial guidance that we can remember that these rights and human rights of association, assembly, participation, expression also apply to young defenders, and that states have positive obligations to take extra measures to ensure that they can be really exercised by the young defenders, environmental defenders, and that they can be protected. So very briefly, just to reflect, that according to the European standards, the states have positive obligations to ensure that the environmental activists can enjoy their rights and freedoms. And that means, first of all, creating that enabling environment of which the commissioner spoke, meaning that the young groups must be recognized, respected, they have to be able to exist, and they have to be able to flourish with public and political support. The second is to, be, to have really uh, strong legal frameworks which enable them to exercise their rights. But the frameworks are not enough, as you said on paper. There must be specific mechanisms put in place that will allow them, because of their nature and their age, to be able to exercise their rights when they have a protest, to be able to be protected against counter-protesters and to consider what kind of protections, special protections have to be put in place by the police considering their age. They also have to have legal guarantees that they can be consulted in a participatory way when policies are made. But it's not just enough to say that in a law. There should be specific outreach mechanisms to come to them in the field to be able to include some informal ways of consultation so that they really can be able to understand the policies and to be able to provide meaningful impact in them. So we really need to be thinking deeper if that's the community we want to bring up and enable what tools and mechanisms we can put in place so that that really is effective and meaningful. We also have to protect them against violence, not just from the public, but as it was said, also from the companies and other actors which have big interest in environmental issues. States also have, we call them negative obligations, meaning they have to refrain. And I will only mention three because they were previously very nicely mentioned, many others. But I think the most preliminary one, which we see really big problem with, is that issue of narratives and smear campaigns. And that is really something states should refrain to do. We cannot shed negative connotations, undermine young environmental defenders. They will not chill. We cannot also crack down on them. Right? That we cannot just discriminate just because of their age and try to undermine their ability to come together or put some funding or other organizational restrictions so that they cannot form if they should wish to form organizations or they cannot exist informally just because that's their nature. And of course, any arrest, detention or criminalization is problematic and should be done with care and as a last resort. As we will hear from our lineup of inspirational speakers, there are many models through which young environmental groups come together and ensure their voice and messages are heard and considered. And we as society must ensure that we protect and we enable that voice. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Katerina, for, for outlining the brief prepared by the expert council um, and for your words about ensuring that uh, children are not discriminated against and they're actually seen as right holders, uh, you know, in their own rights. Um, I would now like to pass on to Bruce. I think we all know that there's been a lot going on in Scotland around incorporation of the CRC and also, of course, heading to COP26. Uh, so I think he's going to touch on all of those things now. Over to you, Bruce. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Jade. And thanks to the Expert Council and the World Forum for this amazing event. And 
huge welcome to all the human rights defenders and young environmental defenders who are here. I've got the best job in the world as Children's Commissioner for Scotland because I get to spend my days working closely with young human rights defenders and young environmental defenders. And it's really inspiring. It's been challenging over the last year during COVID as we've moved more online. But I'm looking forward to the discussions today. Um, I think the welcome recognition that the Commissioner set out in her opening that the international community is growing to understand the important focus of healthy environment as a human rights which flows through all rights. And we have to make sure that we support the international community to do that. And I strongly welcome the Council of Europe's decision to include climate change within the children's rights strategy, which is currently being developed, and the publication um, uh, that Katrina and others have, have set out of the new standards, which is amazing in the Commissioner's new comment. I have the privilege of chairing the European Network of Ombudspersons for Children, which is 43 uh, commissioners from across Europe. Um, and we are lucky in that we're human rights defenders, but we're protected by law to be independent. And so our role in supporting young human rights defenders and environmental defenders is to support, empower, equip and protect. And we need to make sure that, that young people are involved both in participatory mechanisms, but also allowing for that activism and protest as well. And so over the next few years, we want to really build on the work that's been done, including by the Committee on the Rights of the Child at the UN with their Day of General discussion in 2018 and Child Rights Connects toolkit on child, child human rights defenders, which I think is fantastic. We also produced one in, in Scotland in 2019. But it has to be focused on a public recognition that young environmental defenders are an important part of decision making. And that's from the earliest age. So I'm particularly in, impressed with the role of younger children. And we need to create spaces for them at every level of decision making, um, at the international level, domestic level, local level, but also online as well. And independent children's rights institutions and national human rights institutions have got a strong mandate. Many of us can receive direct complaints, and we need to strengthen that in environmental matters, conducting investigations, and also supporting strategic litigation, which I think, again, as the Commissioner said, we're going to see a lot more of as we hold states to account and others to account as well. And I think this is hugely important. The European Network of Ombudsperson for Children have chosen climate justice as our next year's theme. And so there's going to be a lot more focus from us on how we can support environmental defenders. And so please do get in touch with a Children's Commissioner Ombudsperson in your own country, see what they're doing and work with them as well as the commitment at the European level. And so um, as Jade had said, and I'm, I'm aware that I want to make time for, for discussion and not go on too long, but um, it's very exciting in Scotland at the moment that we have the incorporation of the Convention on the Rights of the Child into our domestic law that'll come into effect later this year. It's going to be a powerful tool to engage with accountability mechanisms. But we also have a commitment from the government to incorporate further human rights treaties and the right to a healthy environment. And so that's something to look to too. And we have COP26. And so the UN Climate Change Conference will be taking place in Scotland and Glasgow in November, we hope. And it's important that children and young people's voices are heard in line with those international obligations. And delegates must be reminded of the importance of engaging with children and young people and being accountable to them. We're working with the Scottish Government to make sure that children are um, supported in the lead up to COP26. And we've got proposals for, for workshops focusing on empowering children and young people. But really importantly as well, we need to make sure that the design and build of, the, of COP26 and the policing of it is in line with a human rights based approach so that children and young people of all ages can act as young human rights defenders and be part of that really important conference. And time is running out as we're consistently told by, by young environmental defenders. And so I'm working very closely with the police here in Scotland to make sure that the way in which policing is done in Scotland ensures the rights and respect for young human rights defenders. But Rather than hear from me, I do want to pass you to one of my young advisors, Cole, um, because I think, as always, young people are so much better at expressing what needs to be done than adults are. Um, David, could you play the video, please? Thank you. Hi, I'm Cole. I'm 17 and I'm a young advisor to the Children and Young People's Commissioner for Scotland. 
My involvement with the climate movement stretches back to when I was 13. I made a film for a competition ran by Keep Scotland Beautiful about how fracking affected our communities and about how starting another method of extraction at a time when we so desperately have to end extraction would impact my country. Since then I've done a whole host of things. In September 2019 I spoke at the Edinburgh Climate March about how we have to change the narrative that the school strikes means young people skiving off for a day in the sun. It's about how, the, about how the media portrayed young people and about how direct action like the school strikes is so important. Most recently, I worked with a whole host of young people to organise a climate hustings with the leaders of Scotland's five largest parties. We organised it. We asked questions of politicians. That's not something that happens every day. A young people orientated and young people designed event with such high profile politicians. We had questions on marine environment to uh, to how climate would work in an independent Scotland. In terms of insight, what I think I would say is that we have to move away from the narrative that collective, the individual action alone can solve climate change. Because as, as important as, you know, not using plastic straws or not buying an aluminium can is, we have to, we have to realise that in order to solve the climate crisis, we have to address the fact that our global economic system, which is predicated on profit and accumulation, is incompatible with solving the climate crisis. Solving the climate crisis is about collective action. It's about changing the way we live. A system which relies on endless spending and endless accumulation will not be compatible with a system in which we solve the climate crisis. And I'm happy to leave my last words to Cole, so I'll pass back to you, Jane. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Bruce. It's it's really great to hear about uh, the work that's being on going on to get ready for COP26 and ensuring children can have their say there and also that uh, the ombudsperson's uh, focusing on climate change for the year. So that's great. Um, and I think it's interesting from here from Cole uh, touching back on what the commissioner said about and, and Katerina said about the way that young people are framed sometimes by commentators um, and the negative framing of that. I think it'd be great if we can uh, discuss that in our panel and I'll also definitely be coming back to you on policing um, because that's a very interesting uh, issue, certainly in the UK, but I know everywhere else as well. Um, so thank you very much. I will now pass over to Tina who is going to talk about uh, ensuring a space for young voices and also how you protect uh, young voices. Sorry, everyone, just one second, as is always with these virtual events, having slight technical difficulties. Uh, we can't hear, you know. Now we perhaps then move on to our next speaker while Tida sort of arranges herself. Um, hopefully, is Ilias there? Are you with us, Ilias? Oh, no, sorry, we've had, he's having technical difficulties. All right. Um, well, then, coming up, uh, we, we were going to save uh, uh, Linus's intervention for last because he had some interesting suggestions for us about solutions, and we thought that might wrap everything up nicely at the end of the speakers. But if you wouldn't mind going now, um, it would be great to hear about your experiences, please. Um, yeah, I, I can do that totally. So, first of all, um, thank you for the kind introduction. Thank you so much for uh, having me. Um, I'm really delighted to be speaking here today. So in my past years as a young climate activist, uh, starting 2018 in Switzerland, where I co-founded the climate strike movement there uh, to later different international activities till now living in Germany and working here with Fridays for Future Germany, um, there was actually one thing, one struggle that um, every young activist I've been working with shared during that time. And that was the struggle of not being taken seriously. Um, and no matter if that was in the media, in talks with politicians we've had, with other people in power, or maybe even with your own grandparents, um, young people seem to collectively be denied any political agency. And now I'm sure this is reason multifactorial, but to me there was one thing that was really standing out in this, um, and that was the, the right to 
vote to participate in the democratic process. Um, there are a couple of very interesting historical examples, which unfortunately I don't really have the time to uh, go into very much, but essentially they show how influential the political status quo is on what people consider adequate rules about democratic participation. Um, basically, whenever the group of people that already was allowed to participate should, should be enlarged, uh, there were protests um, against that, sometimes even from the group that should be included in that uh, very case. So what this basically shows us is that the question of voting rights actually goes far beyond the actual right to vote, who is entitled to vote and who is not um, really also determines who's given political agency and who is taken seriously and who is not. Um, and that exactly is the link between tackling the climate crisis and allowing youth to participate in the democratic process. While, as we've heard, youth are, are at the forefront of fighting for political action to tackle the climate crisis, um, because we are the ones that will have to live, live with the effects of it, um, it's like the, the, the climate crisis in its conception is a crisis that disproportionately affects younger generations. Um, but of course, we do need all generations to, um, like our society as a whole, to tackle it. So one first crucial step towards acting on the climate crisis um, is, of course, taking it seriously. And there's there's that connection then. So by granting, by not granting you the right to vote, issues important to us um, are, are being taken less uh, seriously by all the generations, by politicians, by people in power, um, which keeps us from solving it. And so by lowering the voting age, that would not only be a huge step forward for democracy, because it obviously leads to better representation, it could also help society accept the climate crisis as the overwhelming threat and, and challenge that it is, which, as I said, is crucial to start solving it. And to close, um, I, I would like to add some words about um, how this maybe could look like concretely. Um, currently, in, in almost all countries, the age requi required to vote is somewhere between 18 and 25. Um, and as, as justification for high ages, it's, uh, it's often said young people are not, not mature enough, are not informed enough, or are not capable of really coming up with their own reflected opinion. Um, and now besides the fact that things as information or maturity really in a democracy must never be standards to granting someone a fundamental democratic right, um, we also know by now that these assumptions are basically wrong. Children do have, um, uh, ch children from an average age 12 to 15 do have all requirements um, to form their own reflective opinions uh, intellectually. So uh, these these arguments actually are really invalid in that case, and and uh, my my personal su suggestion on um, what an ideal state voting system would would look like is basically I would keep a normative limit, which I do think can make things easier in practice, uh, which would be at sixteen, because as I said, the um, the requirements to to form an um, uh, an opinion, a uh, well-reflected opinion, are on average reached between 12 and, 15, and 12 and 15. And so we see at 16, the vast majority um, of people would have reached that. And additionally, um, people below 16 would have uh, the possibility to sign up for voting if they, if they um, feel like, uh, like if they want to and feel like they're capable of doing so. So I can surely go on and walk through many different arguments for hours for and against this, but since I don't want to go over time too much, um, I think I'll leave it here. Thank you for the possibility to speak, and uh, thank you for my uh, for the fellow speakers and uh, listeners. All right, thank you so much for those uh, comments. Um, and I I think the the question about the right to vote is such an interesting one because over so many you know hundreds of years we've seen the franchise expand and it's always the argument that that only certain people get to hold that that very key right and as you so rightly say it's not just about whether you can go to the ballot and tick the box and and move on and I mean I think with children I've always found this very odd dichotomy that 
you know, in, say, in most states, you're, you're apparently considered not mature enough to vote, but you're considered mature enough to face a criminal charge at a much younger age. So there's a very uh, odd dichotomy there, I think, I think uh, with that, um, which is, which is, to be clear, is not at all <laughs> an argument for saying that the age of criminal responsibility should be lowered. I think it should go the other way. But uh, the voting, the voting age to come down, the age of criminal responsibility to to come up, perhaps to to meet that. Um, so thank you very very much for those comments, and we'll be able to uh, explore them further when we get to the question and answer. So I think uh, now, hopefully, we have uh, Tina. Can you can you hear us? And I hope I so. Perfect. Can you hear me? Please go on. <laughs> It wouldn't be an online event if there wasn't some technical issue. So I'm happy to have taken that, <laughs> taken that ball. Um, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. So thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, as Jade mentioned, I am uh, an international expert on child participation and safeguarding. So I wanted to reflect a little bit on the role that children can play um, in, in environmental discussions and, and in, in all kinds of activism. Because not only, and, and I think there, there has been a point already raised that, that environmental issues and, and human rights are very interlinked. Um, furthermore, children's rights are very interlinked with environmental rights as well. We do have a special article in the Convention of, of, uh, of, of Children's Rights, Article number, number 24, that talks in specifically about the environment. Furthermore, we have Article 27 that speaks about safe homes, and we know that the environment is, for example, causing um, children and, and, and adults to live in in countries that are not safe anymore due to environmental harm, uh, such as in the South Pacific. Of course, we then have the articles that speak about children's rights to participate and children's rights to have their voices heard, such as Article 12 about re respecting children's uh, voice, um, respecting uh, or giving them the right to speak freely in Article 13 and setting up joint groups in Article 15. So we have a very clear mandate for children to take part in this uh, this discussion and this, uh, this uh, advocacy. Um, on top of that, this is not only the right of children to actually have their voices heard in these issues, but what is actually also very interesting for us, the adults, is how much we benefit from having children as a part of this conversation. So I work for the Ombudsperson uh, for Children in Iceland, and as a part of my role, I uh, work for the Children's Council, the government's Children's Council and SDGs. And so we have actually, our Prime Minister has a Children's Council to work specifically on SDGs. And as everybody who knows the SDGs knows, the SDGs span such a wide variety of issues that basically we now have everybody within the government wanting to reach out to this, to this Children's Council for um, feedback on anything that they do, which is fantastic. But what I've really, really learned from those kids, and I mean, I've been working with kids now for, and I, I say kids, that's everybody under the age of 18, which is just, uh, that's very important when talking about children's rights in all, in, in all regards that, that this is the age group we're talking about. Um, but it's so interesting to work with uh, children of this, of this age because they are so eager to talk about the environment. This is a topic so close to their heart, and they, are so, they, they want to participate in this because they're passionate about this. They are thinking about their own future. They're seeing where the environment stands today and how they can make sure that they have a sustainable future, that they can raise kids in this world, and so on and so forth. And they're so connected to the topic. I'm learning a great deal from children about just things like, like waste and how to use uh, re and recycling and reusing and all of these things. Children are so aware of things that, I mean, I'm not very old, I'm 34, and still the change that has happened in the past maybe 20 years since I was a teenager to today, we never thought about these issues. Kids today are so aware of these things and they're so on top of these things and they teach me new things all the time. And I think in the conversations that we're having, it is so important to have young people and children as a part of our conversation because they, in very many ways, know more than we do about these issues because they're so passionate about it. So I think that's so beneficial for us to have them as a part of the, of the, of the conversation. Here in Iceland, we're doing a lot of consultation with children. Um, so me, as a, in, in my role, on, on behalf of the government, I do consultation with children. It does not matter what I'm asking them about. They always find a way to bring up the environment. And I think that is that is the, a very, very clear 
um, indicator of how much this ma matters to them. Um, time runs really quickly when you only have five minutes, so I'm going to skip a few of my points. And I want to I wanna, uh, highlight as well, in when talking about participation of children, and as Bruce uh, mentioned as well, we need to talk about the participation and their right to advocate. Um, we also need to underline the importance of safeguarding the children in, in, in everything that they do. And, and the commissioner spoke about this in the beginning as well, of, of how do we protect the children, how do we safeguard the children, so that we can create a platform where they can talk freely and they can participate, but at the same time we are making sure that they are not being um, that they're not being harmed because of their participation. And this can be so easy, especially now with the, on, with the online environment. We can have so many, many people just attacking them directly. We have strong environmental activists that have gotten uh, famous worldwide, and they're getting seriously high-profile people talking against them online. So we need to make sure that, that when we are allowing for this space, we also create some safeguards that we can that the children can reach out to, that there are uh, individuals even that can support them, that we do have a training on on matters such as how do we respond to, to hate speech, how do we respond to people that are that might not agree with us, how do we work on how do we um, how do we respect free freedom of speech at the same time as we don't allow for hate speech, for example? How do we deliver a message in the right way? Especially when children are putting things online and they can't take things back or something that lives forever, something that can be rec recorded and put online. How are we ensuring that those children that are actually being an activist and are actually participating are also being kept safe? Um, and especially when we are also talking about uh, maybe places where the IT literacy is not very very strong, we might not have children that know how the internet works completely or how much things can spiral when, once they get on the internet. Um, and then again, the, also the kids that, that might not have access to the internet, um, so they might not be able to educate themselves on what's happening and they might not be able to, to join in the conversation at the same level as other, other children. This also brings back children that might not have um, the, the ability to understand the internet or they might not have the language to participate. We need to make sure that everything, basically, <laughs> everything that we possibly can um, take forward and create a safe space for all children to participate um, in what we're doing. Um, and this is... Yeah, so, so this is this is so wide. And for when we're talking about, for example, the government supporting children to take part and, and, and participating, incredibly important and, and can be incredibly uh, useful. But we need to make sure as well that they are doing it correctly and, then they, and they need to show a good precedence in, in how we can actually safeguard the children to have their voices heard at the same time as we are keeping them safe. Um, like I say, I could go on and on, but I see that I'm already past my time. The, these five minutes are way, way shorter than they were when I was practicing. Um, so I will uh, leave it up, leave it here, leave a lot of open questions, I guess, um, and allow for time for the conversations later. Thank you. Thank you so very much for that. Um, you know, one, one of my questions is going to be around sort of what, what should we be teaching children about how to keep themselves safe? So you've done a, a great job there of, of starting off that, that conversation for us. Um, and also just, you know, reiterating that message about how much adults can, can learn from children and the importance of, of seeing them, um, as, as people who have important contributions to make. Uh, so, we unfortunately, I think we can't we can't quite get hold of um, Ilias, which is a shame as I had a very good conversation with him uh, yesterday in one of. Oh, I think he might be back. Um, uh, we might give him a few minutes, actually, to sort of get it, get himself organized before throwing him in it. So I, I might uh, ask a question if I can first of our, our panelists. Um, and really, to, to pick up on this issue uh, about uh, policing of protests and policing specifically in relation to children um, and ideas around how that can be done uh, safely, what's the best way to police uh, protests, but also protests involving children? I don't know, Bruce, if you want to perhaps come in on that first. Yeah, it's a, it's a, a huge issue. Um, obviously, with COP26 coming up in Scotland, it, it's very much a, a focus. But 
it's been something we've been working on for, for a long time, and particularly over the last 15 months in the context of COVID, where public health becomes a concern in terms of how do you ensure that people can um, undertake legitimate protest um, in the context of a, a public health pandemic. Um, and so there's been a lot of learning around that. But in the run-up to, to COP26, one of the, the big challenges um, that we have is that there'll be police coming in from other parts of the UK as well, because it's intended to be such a big event. And so while we've made some good um, progress with Police Scotland, we need to be clear that, that there, there may be other police forces involved as well. And so uh, human rights-based education for the police is absolutely essential part of this, and a participative approach in advance of planned protests. And so if we know there's going to be planned protests, we need ways in which the police can be supportive of that right. Um, and particularly if children and young people are going to be part of that, some really good dialogue needs to happen between police and protest organisers about how um, children and young people will be kept safe. And so um, that's really good. But um, there also needs to be further work because a kind of impromptu protest, protest just doesn't need to be organised in that way. And so it's really important that we build up training amongst police and amongst private security and others of the state's obligation to make sure that um, peaceful protest is um, accepted and encouraged. And so lots more dialogue to be done. We're working very hard in Scotland. We're on an advisory group to the police, independent advisory group on that at the moment. And what's really important is that children and young people's voices are a big part of those discussions. Great, thanks so much, Bruce. Um, did anyone else from the panel want to come in on that? Um, otherwise, I will. I, we now have uh, Ilias with us, so I will give the floor to Ilias to give his uh, five-minute intervention. Um, hopefully, he is still there. Uh, hello. Uh, first of all, the signal, the mobile signal, is not the best, so please uh, don't turn on the camera. Uh, so. My name is Ilyas. I am an activist for climate justice with Fridays for Future in Ukraine. I do speak on my behalf and on behalf of my group with my secretary mandate. For the people who live in Ukraine and uh, the other most affected beyond, for us, for us, the environment and climate can cost health or even lives. Sidos Richards says that most affected people in Ukraine are often women, children, youth, LGBTQ, minorities, and people with disabilities or age. Those, those groups coincide to be with low or even without income. And to face uh, violence or discrimination when it is to find shelters. Ukraine actually is the second agri-food product exporter to the EU, while, green, while German-Ukrainian agri-political dialogue says that harvest of most important cultures for Ukraine might decrease by 17% if no ambitious climate action will be taken. Our food is sold to us with same, if not even most expensive prices as if it was exported to the EU, while we have a big gap in, in GDP. Actually, Ukraine's GDP is below global average. UNDP says poverty is below the line for about 60% of Ukrainian population. We are only youth, children, and those who are the most affected by climate crisis. We do fight as we can for our rights, our lives and our future. Nobody has teached us how to self-organize. I had to learn by myself what is civil responsibility. My group in Kharkiv or in Ukraine as well. Democratic instruments and peaceful associations are something new for us because there was 
no teaching in our studies program on what is civil self-organization or any accessible instruments. My first school and feudal strikes, strikes were welcomed with only irritation, excuses, or indirect threats from the local governments. We, we got self-organized where we were inviting our friends, our fellows, organizations, and maybe other minorities, com communities those supported us, but it wasn't so from the big medias in Ukraine. There were like not speaking about climate strikes on what is happening internationally or even in Ukraine. Nobody from the normal population for which big media are are all the, the most important uh, sources of information. Nobody have nobody have sp spoke about us or have made a bad reputation for us as being not professional. How professional children and youth should be, how professional those who are affected socially should be. We don't understand them. Well, Ukraine is supposed to join the EU with uh, EU regulation standards and rights. We do, have, we do have the rights on peaceful assemblies, which are formal, but with f possible physical consequences for our lives. In Ukraine, private persecution is widely practiced. In Kharkiv, back in 2019, after big symptoms, big September strikes, I've got doused with tear gas, gas two times in one day. In 2020, Human Rights Center's MENA fixed around 101 attacks on activists. In 2021, 31 attacks by the end of March, among which two attacks on activists of Fridays for Future in Ukraine. While Russian aggression is uh, present, we do see how far-right organizations and paramilitary radical organizations are raising in Ukraine. We do see and experience, we experience uh, big pressure on us. They are present next to our strikes. They are watching us. Sometimes they they try to to go after us in, after our strikes. We do our best, but with COVID, uh, with coronavirus, uh, we can't go on strikes as it was before the pandemic situation. But our fight still continue and don't stop here. This year we started the direct directing civil appeals to the central Ukrainian government. We tried to request Euro European Court of Human Rights to be third party in, cl in climate lawsuit, lawsuit of Claudina Duarte Augustino against Portugal and 30 other European states, including Ukraine. Right now, we are writing a report to the OECE and special report uh, to the 76th UN Global Assembly. We experience that we are doing things that are not things that we don't really need to do, actually. We just needed to go study or go find uh, full-time work. But right now, we see ourselves forced to do what actually our government has to do. In round tables with the government or special meetings with them, we hear formal excuses. We hear just empty words instead of action. All we needed is just a safe future and our human rights being given to us, as in many other countries in Europe. 
I'm thankful for the organizers of this meeting and as well as the Director General on Democracy of Council of Europe for the possibility. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ilias, and for persisting uh, despite the technical difficulties uh, to try and join us. Um, it really puts things into picture to hear about uh, the struggles of children and young people um, exercising their rights in countries um, around climate change. So thank you very much. Um, we have a question about that's coming about the right to vote, um, which is a question to uh, Linus, please, um, about how your actions about the right to vote have been received by the people that are currently in power. Is this something that that is uh, that you're able to get traction on? What's what's the response been? Um, so I can just answer that for Germany. Actually, right now it's been it's been such a long debate. Like in the past, it's been really going on for years, and and the demand um, of of lowering the voting age at least to sixteen um, has has been something that's been discussed since the nineteen nineties, I believe. Um, and then there, like um, on the on the state level, so on the state level, um, the past six years the Conservative Party has been in charge, and within that time, it's not been implemented. But actually, um, civil society through civil society engagement, um, right, um, up until now, the disc there was kind of a discourse shift, so that actually right now all the parties except for the Conservative Party um, are are demanding to lower the voting age on a state level to voting age 16. Uh, so it's actually been going quite well. Um, yeah, and, and right now, I don't know, there was a there was a climate law um, actually in front of the uh, federal court that, that's been decided on a couple of weeks ago, probably heard about that. Um, and, after, and actually, we're thinking about following up with a um, with a law case about voting age 16, because that that um, decision kind of used a new way to um, interpret freedom of future generations. And so that could. Um, yeah, also allow to to get a successful claim about voting at 16, but we'll see. So yeah, it's going interesting. Thank you very much. It's good to hear actually that that some progress is is being made and that you are you are being listened to on on that issue. Um, so a question has come in for uh, Tina, please. Um, what are some of the good practices that you've heard of or worked on um, uh, about making young environmental Defenders better protected against online um, and offline hate speech or negative framing. So I think we also heard that in uh, the video from uh, Cole, the young advisor in Scotland, about you know children being framed as sort of slacking off, skiving off school, and and all those things. So any any good practice or thoughts on that? Absolutely. Thank you for the question. Um, I think this this uh, goes hand in hand with most all safeguarding mechanisms that we speak about when talking about participation, and especially online participation. Um, so there are very uh, kind of clear ways where you can try to contradict these. And this is, for example, um, when you know who your participants are, a very vital thing is to prepare them, for them to understand what might come, for them to understand what they are engaging in, so that they know what kind of um, feedback they might be getting and that they know what kind of uh, arguments they might be getting into as a part of their participation. This needs to be done in the right way so that we don't uh, demotivate them to participate, but but prepare them to to uh, deal with any kind of aftermath. Um, a very good way to tackle this is to have a good support network as well. So when the children start experiencing some kind of hate speech or some kind of uh, bullying, that they have somebody to turn to and that they have somebody to to guide them through the the experiences that they might be well through yeah through what they might be experiencing because what is very dangerous is if if you have a very powerful and uh, very passionate young person stepping forward wanting to take part in in something that for them is a very obvious thing that we should all agree on such as protecting the environment um, and then once they start receiving some backlash and they're just receiving some hate speech, they might feel very demotivated to participate, and they might, and this might have a very bad uh, effect on them. So just so that, just that they kind of that they are prepared for 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 what might come. Um, all kinds of training and education for them: how to deliver a message, how to have conversations, how to 
do the arguing uh, in, a, in a meaningful way understanding the policies and practices that are in place so that they can also use that in their in their advocacy um and have yeah and and also when you are doing online events such as such as this one or, or or something be very much aware of who is participating how are you portraying the children are you putting the children on camera do they know that they're on camera are you have they thought about just things like what is behind them on the camera do they could they have a brother or a sister coming into the room um do they do you know who is participating and a and a very very important factor here as well is what kind of um connection are you are you inviting your participants towards the children that are participating so uh, do they have clear access to the children fantastic when you have an open chat like this where people can be communicating and you can have an open communication but is there a way for a participant potentially a, an ill attended participant to be reaching the child directly um either through through the platform that you're working on or not on that platform but through social media are you giving up the the full name of the child so that if i want to attack that child as somebody in another country i can do that um and lastly as well i wanted to point out briefly um we often well it, it happens that we have children even standing up against their own governments so that is that is a very uh, important thing to have clear safeguarding mechanisms in place is that if a child is standing up and and speaking uh against their government their government is doing something that they don't think is correctly that uh, correct they're not working on the environment especially with governments that that might not welcome democratic conversations um that we do have some kind of uh an 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 anonymity for that child that they can actually speak without having to then maybe go home or or just walk out the door and be punished for that um so i mean there are a lot of safeguarding uh, mechanisms in place and 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 uh, that you can you can follow but i think these are kind of yeah some of the 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 top level ones Great, thank you very much for that. That's a really, really helpful and, and detailed answer and, and lots in there to learn. Um, we've had an interesting question about uh, younger children being involved in in activism, I think it's designed at sort of much younger children and how parents might be needed to, to support that um, and whether panelists have any thoughts on how the, how the rights of parents um, and how human rights of parents can be linked to the realization of children's rights to protest. So for example, if parents need to take time off work uh, to help support children to go to protests or, or attend meetings. Um, yeah, any thoughts from, from anyone in the panel on that question? Bruce, do you wanna? Yeah, this this is a great question, and it was covered in the Child Rights Connect um, toolkit on child human rights defenders. It was quite a, a big discussion amongst the um, advisory group that we had on that, because a lot of the experience from from young people um, were was that sometimes parents were were hugely supportive, but sometimes they were a barrier. And so, how do you get that balance between addressing the very understandable um, concern from parents to keep their children safe um, with the agency of children and young people to actually be part of something and when it works at its best then the younger child and, and the parent are, are of one mind and they're working together but how how do you how do you manage when that's not um quite lined up and one of the things that we talked about was the need for state education around um the rights of children as human rights defenders to make sure that, that parents are given some assurance because the overriding concern from parents was that their children would be unsafe and get into trouble um, and so a big part of it is making sure that we create the environments where it is safer for children to be involved and if we're talking about really young children who are, who are needing parental support then again we need to see that within the context of the broader right to, to protest and parents are allowed to be involved in that and those discussions that go on and every family all over the world um, around what children want to do and what, what parents want to do. Um, but the, the key thing is making sure that um, parents can be assured that it'll be safe to take children um, and also allow children to go and creating those really safe environments is absolutely key. Right, uh, many, can I many thanks. add to that? Yeah, of course, go for it, please. Sorry. Yeah. 
I, I just wanted to point out as well that that uh, adult support does not necessarily have to be parental support. So when we are talking about even the younger children, I mean, a lot of this could happen through even kindergarten or through schools with uh, teachers or, or with even just uh, advocates that that are working on children's rights or are used to working with children. Um, so that whole issue of, of parents needing uh, time off work to go pr protesting, this should not limit the children to be able to participate. Um, even though, of course, as Bruce mentioned, the, it, it's fantastic when they can do this together and there's a, there's a support both ways and so forth. But yeah, uh, adult support does not always have to be parental support, even with the younger children. That's a really good point. Thank you for that, um, Tina. Um, so a question, I think, probably for uh, Linus and, and Elias. Um, both of you have talked about uh, possibly being involved in, in court actions, and we've seen, um, obviously, the, the huge case before the European Court of Human Rights, which is, I think, interesting to all of us involved in human rights and the, and the legal profession for so many reasons. Do you think uh, bodies like the European Court of, of Human Rights and courts generally are accessible to children, or do they? Does it feel like going to those, take, taking complaints to those kinds of courts and, and huge, huge institutions, which uh, are intimidating even to adults, is is accessible to children? Do either of you want to come in on that, or? Uh, yeah, I can, I can start off. Oh yeah, Ilias, go first. Okay, thank you. So, uh, for the case of Ukraine, it is not really accessible because our court system is uh, really complex. We do say that our court system is likely to be like with the Roman model of uh, justice and jurisprudence, but it is really not accessible for people who do not know the law and such can be children and uh, very youth, young people. In two years of activism with Fridays for Future, many in our team had to learn for themselves how some kind of laws works, because uh, even, if we had, uh, even if we have access to free, uh, to free legal help for non-profits as our group, we don't need to understand for ourselves how we will interfere and which consequences we could have. Because even if we will be represented in court, we will need to talk. We will, nobody will be able to write for us anything. We will need to prepare ourselves. And mainly in Ukraine, uh, after the Soviet Union, ideas that anybody can do anything, but for doing anything, we really feel our, ourselves forced to learn to be professionals. Actually, we are, we are just youth, but, but the local society wants us to be professional, and it's really hard, and we get indirectly discriminated because of that. Also, Many NGOs uh, or just civil society thinks that courts doesn't uh, really work in Ukraine because, for example, after the the global the overall Ukrainian uh, civil society decision to be more U in the European way, uh, even after many reforms after the Euromaidan. We have still corruption problems, as one of the clear examples is the dismissal of the anti-corruption court as part of the high courts of Ukraine. So about, it's not really a possibility, I think, for youth in Ukraine to have some legal processes in domestic courts. Uh, th thank you. Thank you very much for that, Ilias. It's really helpful. And and what about in Germany? I, I mean, we've seen a young person take take the case, which is the one I think you were referring to before, with success. Um, but does it feel, you know? And, and I guess also helpful to know what things what things would help you take take legal action if that's what you wanted to do from from 
from people like us really on this call. Yeah. Um, so, so first of all, I think like the situation is, I mean, it's, we, we've only been able to kind of come up with that, um, with that law case because we had like broad alliances with, we, we teamed up with lawyers, with NGOs and stuff. And I mean, it's a huge, huge, huge privilege to be able to, to do that. And, and I, I think it's, um, and, and still, I, I mean, I think it's, it's horrible that in so many other places, this is probably just not, um, not doable, um, for the people that, that would actually need it so, so badly. Um, what I think what helped us was kind of a mixture in, in the alliance behind the, the uh, law case that, that was, yeah, on one side, like professional lawyers that, that would like do all the legal stuff. And then on the other, on the other hand, like some civil society actors that would, uh, kind of get some media attention and, and some NGO help. So it was just like, it was like so much, so much work, so much effort, uh, go, going into there. And, and it's, um, yeah, on one hand, it feels great to be able to do that. And, and it really gives me hope because if I, I do feel like litigation and, uh, legal processes can be such an important tool for, um, getting, getting action on human rights and, and climate and, and issues about the climate crisis in the future. Um, and on the other hand, I do feel like it's, um, it, it would be therefore so important to um, make sure it's it's a tool more accessible to uh, people in other places. Great, thank you very much for that. Um, so we actually only have uh, five minutes left. This has been such an interesting discussion um, and everyone's uh, contribution has been so interesting that the, that the time has sped by. Um, I'd like to just ask if our panelists have any final sort of <laughs> very short remarks that anyone would like to make. Otherwise, I will I will sum up. Nothing from anyone. OK, great. I mean, this is this is, as I said, this has been an incredibly interesting discussion and we've covered such a huge range of topics. So it's it's hard to sum this up, I think. But I think probably uh, the, the most important thing is is. Uh, to listen to children and young people um, and to recognize the disproportionate impact that uh, environmental degradation and climate change is having on them and uh, you know to stress that 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 makes their voices even more important um, there's lots of challenges that we've heard about today but there's lots of also uh, amazing things being done really extraordinary things being done um, despite those challenges um, and it's great to see children and young people um, coming together to do that across the world um, since the climate strikes and since then. Um, so that all that remains for me to do is to say our thank yous really. So thank you very, very much to our speakers uh, for their contributions today. Um, thank you also to my colleagues on the Expert Council on NGO law, particularly uh, Carla and Antoine, who have not been seen on this video, but have played an integral part in getting this event off the ground. And of course, to the Council of Europe staff for the very smooth running of this event. It's always hard to, to do a virtual event, um, uh, given the technical difficulties, but particularly to David, thank you very, very much for all your assistance. Um, we're very grateful. Um, and thank you also to our audience for listening and for your time on these issues. If you want to learn more about these uh, issues, you can go to the to the website of the World Forum for Democracy. Um, and there's various links there, including in the brief that we prepared. Um, so I wish you all uh, the full enjoyment of all of your human rights going forward um, and a good evening. Thank you very much. Goodbye.